Cool. Thanks, Anil. Uh, well, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, great to see everyone. A um, little bit of a holiday in the United States as well. Today is the day after the fifth of uh, day after the fourth of July, and the way things uh, have been going. To be honest with you, I'm just glad to get on the other side of the fourth of July without the worst kind of fireworks. Um, what a you know symbolic day of American symbolism itself. So what a, what a day to uh, attack the actual symbols. And so, uh, yeah, very, just very glad <laughs> uh, to be on the other side of the 4th of July, to be honest with you. Great to be here with you guys this morning. Um, so today I'm gonna get into uh, natural cycles, which I'll explain, and the hero's journey. Um, I've got probably more than we can get all the way through today. So I'm hoping Sunil will, will invite me back for another part to this uh, conversation. Um, and we'll just go as, as far in as we can um, and take it from there. I'm going to share my screen now. I hope you can still see me. Oh, Sunil, when I share my screen, will it be large for, oh, they may, you guys may have to choose your view so that uh, you can see my screen. Uh, just as a heads up, if you can't see my screen now, you might want to change your view uh, to speaker view. Okay. So today we're going to get into what I call natural cycles. And it's a little bit of a word play that I'll explain since uh, it's an English uh, cycle, uh, S, you know, C Y L E, just cycles, circles, cycles, right? Psyche, P S Y C H E, is psyche, you know, your, your mind, your, your soul. Actually, the Greek word psyche is the word for butterfly, but it's also the word for soul. It's also the word for mind. So it's one of those words where mind and soul are kind of the same. So psyche. So cycles is all about cycles of psyche, psychological cycles, uh, spiritual cycles. So what I'm going to do today uh, and in a, a second day, if we need it, is go through some very basic cycles of light and consciousness. And then I'm going to move into circular cycles, uh, journeys of, of main mythic characters. Then I'm going to move into some major theories about mythic cycles. And then probably this wouldn't be till next time, get into some movies uh, to show how some movies are using this, these cycles. And ultimately, what we want to land on is we want to talk about how stories like the hero, uh, structures like the hero's journey have informed Hollywood. Uh, well, especially Hollywood, but also, you know, I just saw, um, I track, I get heroes during Google alerts, right? And so I just got a Google alert that a major um, Bollywood filmmaker was leading a workshop series on the hero's journey uh, for screenwriters in India. So I want to get to, I teach out of film school. I'm a department chair at a film school. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is, you know, my students, they all want to write great movies. So how can I work backwards from their desire to make great movies to teach them mythology? Well, luckily, mythology is so infiltrated Hollywood. Uh, there's a famous story, and I'll go ahead and share it, of George Lucas, who made Star Wars, saying that he could have never written, he could have never finished Star Wars had he not read Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell and used the hero's journey. And then since this time, the hero's journey has become, you know, an inspiration for everything from Indiana Jones uh, all the way to Finding Dory in Pixar movies. It's pervasive. It is completely saturated. Uh, it's, it's hard to even finance a movie that's going to cost over $100 billion if you can't show that it's using the hero's journey these days, it seems. So, or at least I can say that very few $100 million movies get financed that don't demonstrate the pattern of the hero's journey. So for me, I get really bored thinking of the hero's journey as some kind of paint by numbers Hollywood model. Where it's interesting is where this structure is actually emerged from the patterns of major myths and fundamentally, ultimately from patterns of nature and from patterns of our psyche that have been modeled around the patterns of nature. So for example, just an easy example, we wake up and we go to sleep uh, in some relationship with the sunrise and the sunset. <clears throat> So that natural cycle of the stars, uh, of the heavens, has become a cycle of our inner experience. And then this pattern of waking and sleeping is a narrative pattern that can then inform stories. And we've certainly seen many stories that begin when you fall asleep or when the sun sets and that kind of thing, right? So we're going to go down that rabbit hole and look at how these natural cycles uh, become psychological cycles, become mythic cycles, become theories, become films, 
uh, and we'll go as far down that path as we can today. All right, so I'm gonna start with light. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, the sun. So the sun begins, uh, I'm gonna start at noon. Uh, so you can follow along with me, start at the high point. And the real point here is look at this gray circle. We're tracking uh, the high and low of light. Not the sunrise, not the sunset, blah, blah, blah. We're looking at the high and low point of light and that's gonna show us how to align the rest. Okay, so the high point of light in the solar cycle is clearly noon. The low point of light in the lunar cycle in the solar cycle is clearly midnight. So we're losing light where the light goes out at sunset, the light comes back at sunrise. Same thing with the moon, maximum light for the moon is the full moon, minimum light, which was of course uh, yesterday. Minimum light for the moon is uh, a new moon, the empty moon. And we, we wane towards emptiness and we wax towards fullness. And if we look at the, the annual cycle of the summer solstice, we see something similar. The maximum light of the year, the longest day of the year is the summer solstice. The shortest day of the year is the winter solstice. And then we are in the spring, we're having lengthening days, and in the fall, our days are shrinking. So now that we've done this, we can look at how they line up with one another. And this is where it gets to be really interesting. So now what you can see is that uh, there's an alignment of midnight with the new moon, and with the winter solstice. This is the moment when we go from the last little bit of light to the first new spark of light. This transition from the going out of the last bit of light or the, the least light, transitioning to more light. Before we knew that the earth was a sphere and we thought that the earth was flat and we didn't really understand how some of these seasons worked, it was really easy to be afraid when uh, the winter solstice would come, that the days wouldn't get bright ever again, that it would just keep getting darker. The turning point from that moment, from things going from darker to becoming brighter, that turning point is one of the most important moments in the narrative structures of our organic lives. And so it's one of the most important story structure, uh, story points in our stories as well. And so I'm going to tell you about a mythology here in Southern California. So the Native Americans of Southern California, one of the major groups, they're called the Chumash. And the Chumash, uh, they have a ritual on December 21st, the winter solstice, and their shamans, their greatest shamans, their most reliable shamans, will go into a cave. And in the cave, there will be a little, what they call an oculus, you've seen these in, in caves, where there's a little hole above the mouth of the cave. And through that little hole, a light will come through. And only on the winter solstice will the light coming through that hole light up an image in the back of the room. It's kind of like, uh, you know, straight up out of Indiana Jones, if you remember, uh, you know, when they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And it's only on the right day when they put the staff in the right place will the light shine on the magic direction, whatever. But that's really how it was for the Chumash on December 21st. A uh, light would come through this little bitty hole in the cave and light up this figure of a shaman. And what the shaman's job was, was to make sure that on the winter solstice things didn't get darker and darker and darker but that like last year and the year before that that indeed the light starts coming back and so according to their myth at this time a character named coyote uh, and a character named eagle slow are playing dice uh, a, a game of chance and if coyote wins we'll have a good, we'll, we'll turn back to light, it'll be a good year. But if Eagle wins in this moment, then it'll be a bad year, things will stay dark and get darker. <clears throat> and so the shaman's job by dancing and by performing in the light of the winter solstice, they're trying to make sure that the dice land in the right place and that indeed we have a new good year. So you see this moment when, when things are getting to their darkest and are turning back towards light is a critical, critical moment. And it's a critical moment for all of our own projection into what darkness is. Oh man, things are getting darker and darker. Will they ever be light again? You know, we can easily start to think about more than just darkness and we will. We'll start to see these darkness as a metaphor. But the main point here to keep going is to see that an alignment between sunrise and spring equinox. This is when the light comes back to the world. The fall equinox and the sunset or high noon and the full moon, the summer solstice and high noon, 
These are the high points and the low points of light all lined up with each other, uh, day, month, and year. And if we do this in the abstract, we start to see a, a, a pattern building up and we're gonna st stick with this. So this is just a zoom in, just a focus on that little moment when we go from the last little bit of light to the first bit of light. And in stories, as a heads up, this is, this is the end of act two in a Hollywood movie <laughs> and the beginning of act three. Oh, it's all lost, we're totally screwed. We're in the trash compactor, we're never gonna get out. It's all ruined, we're dark, it's, we're all gonna die. And then some magic, oh, wait a minute, I've got the comm link. And then this spark of connection and then things change direction. So you see that that same pattern of where we're worried just even before we even know what our myths were, where we're witty, worried in the winter solstice that we might not see day again. That same pattern becomes a pattern that moves us in our movies when things get to their worst and then they change direction towards light. Okay, so now let's, let's do the same thing, but not with sun, moon, sun and moon, uh, day, month and year. Let's look at this in the context of vitality. So in this case, let's just look at waking up. So what's the high point and the low point of vitality uh, when it comes to waking and dreaming? Obviously, when you are fully awake versus fully asleep, you see the high point and the low point of being fully awake and the low point of being not fully awake at all, the opposite, fully asleep. And then of course, we are waxing towards being awake. We are waning towards being asleep uh, as we move towards uh, sunrise and sunset respectively. Now let's do, this one gets a little bit trickier, uh, but if let's look at the high point of vitality in your life. Oh, sorry, in reproduction, not yet life. This is tricky because life and reproduction, mortality is an overlap between uh, you know, life and death and sex and death. So let's just look at sex and death, okay? So the high point of your sexuality is our sexual prime. What are we, I don't know, 33, 34, whatever we think our sexual primes are supposed to be, this is the prime, sexual prime. And this is when uh, sexuality, this is when you know, having children is expected uh, and flipped around, this isn't just for humans, this is also for flowers. So what's the sexual prime of, of a plant? And when a plant is in full flower. Uh, or an animal uh, when they're also uh, have reached their full prime. Okay, so now obviously um, we're born, in, let me use, if I hope you can see my mouse. Okay, so let's now, uh, this is the most abstract of all of these. It's a little bit tricky. You'll see it once we line it up, how much clearer it is. But what I want you to start to think about is this lower world and this upper world. And this lower world is actually going to be the woman's body. And the upper world is going to be the world that we live in. Okay, so uh, right here at the place where you saw sunset before, this is where you see copulation, pollination. This is when uh, the semen, <laughs> uh, this is when the phallus uh, enters uh, the womb. Uh, this is sex, penetration. But it's also, as you know from the story of the Buddha, this is also the story when he sees the planting of the seeds for the first time. Because, and he's not allowed to see it till he grows up to be old enough to see the seeds being planted because of just how freaking sexual it is to see the plow part the earth, to plant the seed, to close the legs of the earth back up, to see, have the mound on top of the earth like the pregnant belly, the mound over the planted seed. And then eventually when the seed is born, it will be just like a, a baby being born with an umbilical cord. So here we have the impregnation, the entering into the womb of the semen. The fertilization, this is where we have that first spark of life, right? So the semen will die, the egg will die if at the last second it isn't fertilized, if there isn't a new spark of life. So let's see the very first spark of a life, the minimum light. The minimum light you can possibly have, the minimum life, the minimum vitality is that first spark of life, which we're lining up, we're gonna show you later, I'm gonna line up with midnight when you have that first return of light or the summer winter solstice, the first return of light, the first new light. So here's the fetus, the first new light or the flower. And then of course, finally, to be born. 
This is just like sunrise, the sun coming out of the earth, the moon coming up from the earth's horizon, or the baby being born from the womb, or the plant being born from the earth, from the surface of the earth, mother earth, right? So uh, this is abstract, and I hope you guys have followed along with me on this one. It'll tighten up as we see some others. Here's just life and death. So let's just think about life and death. So the prime of life, maximum life at the top, minimum life to be dead at the bottom. Okay, so then this is, of course, birth into life, to come of age, to grow to your prime, to become strong, prime of life, you're a full-grown plant, animal, or human, but then the decline from your prime towards death, and the plant, and the death of the person, the plant, and the animal, and this is where they're buried. They go from being in the world to being buried or a sky burial, of course, where either way, they're changing planes of existence upon death. Just like upon birth, we're changing planes of existence. We're born from wherever we are into this place. Even if all you see that as is being born from your mother's body, and you've heard you know, the cheeky phrase from womb to tomb, womb to tomb, right? So here's the womb, being born from the womb, being buried in the tomb. And of course, um, to be buried in the womb, we're back where we were a second ago. To be buried in the womb is sexual penetration, to bury the semen or the seed. But here we're burying the body in the earth. And of course, burying the body in the earth evokes the feeling that you're planting a seed. And of course, that implies a rebirth. So the planting of Jesus in the cave, and then eventually he's reborn, this follows this pattern too, right? The seed's planted, goes through the underworld, comes back reborn. So that's where we're going. We're about to go towards how myths pattern themselves after these natural cycles. And I don't know why, who knows? I'm not saying it's because of, uh, because some great storyteller was like, let me make a myth that follows the cycle of the sun. Maybe, or maybe it was like, I'm gonna make a myth and the only pattern I don't even realize I know is the solar cycle. It's just inside of me and I write a story and that's what comes out and I didn't even realize it. Or maybe the story is divine and maybe the divine story wants to make sure that it's patterned after nature and the divine message in nature. I don't know, that's not on me to describe. All I wanna show is the alignment of these cycles, the alignment of light cycles, of life cycles, of mythic cycles, of movie cycles. I just wanna show how they line up. Why and how is another question. So here we see the vitality, we see waking, we see the sleep cycle, oops, sorry. We see the sleep cycle, the sexual cycle, and the life cycle. So now the question is, now that we've lined them up, let's, let me ask, let's see if we see some connections between them. You ever associated waking up with being born? Of course. What about falling dead with falling asleep? Of course. So you see these cycles jump each other. So this is the sleep cycle jumping to the sex cycle to wake up to be born, right? But how about to fall asleep and to die? This is the sleep cycle jumping to the life and death cycle. Have you ever thought about dreaming as being dead? Have you ever thought about death as being in a womb? Have you ever thought about life as being conscious? So the point is, is when we take a step back and we just look at the alignments of the high points of vitality and the low points of vitality, and we abstract them, abstract them entirely, and then we line them up. What we start to see is where our metaphors are wanting to come from. We have a natural inclination because these already line up in our minds, deep in our unconscious. You can't help but see this. You can't help but associate the high points and the low points, whether you've come to realize it or not. But you have, and your imagination does, and your metaphors will express this. This is why we have metaphors like the long sleep for dead. To, to die, right? To be dead, right? So the point is, is that these become metaphors based on their very organic, intuitive, natural, and unconscious alignment. So now these are the two of these next to each other. Now you see the light cycles and the life cycles all lined up and abstracted. I'm going to pause and let you look at that and take a sip of coffee because I know I'm just, this is a, a, a machine gun. Okay, so now I want to say the same thing. 
Now I want to point out to you that metaphors jump across these two discs as well. Have you ever associated sunrise with birth? Of course. Uh, we've all seen the Lion King, <laughs> right? Baby Simba at the sunrise. Have you ever associated sunset over here, uh, sunset over here with the light cycles? Have you ever associated sunset with death over here in the vitality cycles? Of course. Have you ever associated sunset with going to sleep? Of course. Now, one of the ones that you might not be quite as familiar with, but you are, how about sunset and sex? Why does the sunset evoke both a romantic feeling and is it associated with death and endings, right? Cowboys right off into the sunset because it's the end. It's the end of the day. But also the sunset represents sexuality. So couples, lovers watching the sun penetrate the earth. It's erotic, right? So we see what the point here is, is that this makes sense for us of a lot of metaphors that we don't even realize why are we lining these things up? We're lining these things up for this reason. Now, why is the winter solstice so frequently associated, so close to New Year's ceremonies? Now, some people's New Year's are solar, some cultures, uh, and, and um, some cultures are particularly lunar. So in China, for example, their New Year is especially focused on the moon. But if the New Year is, a is, a fo sorry, is especially focused on the winter solstice, you know, we've got um, in, the, uh, in the United States, you know, I don't know exactly uh, how y'all, how you guys uh, worship the new year or participate in the new year. Uh, but in the U.S., we have the ball drop at the, on December 31st. Uh, we also have, uh, so the ball drop, this is the last light going out. The last light of the year going out. This is why at the winter solstice, it's the shortest day of the year. And after the winter solstice, the days lengthen. So it's very natural to see the winter solstice as the new year. And in many cultures, it is associated with the new year or very close with it. Um, just for fun, I'm gonna point out to you that yesterday was what's called the Amphelion. The Amphelion is where the earth is the furthest from the sun. And the perihelion is when the earth is closest to the sun. And so the perihelion is always within a couple weeks of the winter solstice. And the amphelion is always within a couple weeks of the summer solstice. These are the high points and the low points of the year, of the day, of the orbits. And uh, anyway, that's an aside, just for fun, because we happen to have been on the, the amphelion yesterday. We are currently as far away from the sun as we get. Uh, or just slightly less since it was yesterday. We're working our way back towards the sun now. Okay, so the main point here is we just use light and we use life to line up these cycles. Now, why are we looking at these cycles? Well, these are the cycles that have been conditioning us since before we were humans. The cycles of light have been conditioning the soil on this earth since before there was life. The solar and lunar cycles the cycles of waking up and falling asleep have been influencing biological life so far before the human form. Sexual procreation, maturation, and death. These cycles, all these cycles you're looking at right here, have been conditioning the human psyche since before life itself. And for as long as life itself. And so the point is, these patterns are embedded in us. We wake up and go to sleep around dark and light. It's such an obvious thing at this point. And even those of us who wake up and go to sleep the other way around, we know it's the other way around. So uh, the point is these cycles are deeply embedded in us. Now, let's say that we've, we've been experiencing these cycles for a million years, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, so, so, so long, before we even tell our first story as a species. What do you think the chances are that that story is just gonna come out with a pattern somewhat relatable to the patterns that have been conditioning us all this time? That's my hypothesis. That's a theory that I'm moving towards and I believe it's true. I believe it's only natural, whether it's God that wants us to do it this way, the divine, or it's just the organic body that can't help it. We start telling stories and the st we're gonna start patterning our, patterning our stories after the cycles of light. Our stories, beginnings, and ends are going to be related to birth and death. 
Okay. So this is a major, uh, and seasons is kind of a deeper dive. Okay. <clears throat> so this is where I'm going to transition to the next conversation. And we're going to start talking about, uh, myths. Um, and okay, perfect. So we're going to start talking about myths and how myths relate to these, but this might be a fine time. We might not have time for a full qu question and answer session, but maybe one or two questions. If anybody wants to ask one at this point, Sunil, is that okay? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, please uh, raise your hand. Even just taking a pause at this point is probably helpful. This the so, stuff I'm talking about. Is there somebody? Great. Yeah, uh, there is a, a Nina, ma'am. Uh, Nina, ma'am, please Nina. ask your question. And this uh, this sounds to me very very familiar. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, Nina, ma'am, uh, can you start from the beginning? Uh, you were yeah. muted at the beginning. Right. Yeah, please. I said um, hello. I said to Professor Lin that this makes so much sense because. Uh, there is one person in India who has written about uh, the commonality of myths across nations, across continents. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. talks, and then there is this theory of golden bow and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. yes, I mean, this is making, because I have uh, read books like the lore, the sun, the, the lore of the sun, the sun, the sh snake lores, the sun lores. Mm -hmm. And again and again, your thoughts echo back to me very similar thoughts that a lot of scholars have put. So yes, it's making a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I would love to know the Indian scholar that you're, yeah. you're mentioning. I'm going to put his name over here in the, in the chat so that you can thank you. Up. Yes. And unfortunately the book is in uh, mother tongue that we have, but you might be able to pick him up in translated version. Okay. All right. Great. So, Excellent. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, just as an aside, it's just great talking with all of all of you today. Just to be connecting from California with you is uh, rewarding and wonderful. And I hope that it models a deeper relationship with in, in mythology, you know. And uh, so please do send a, the scholar. And if it's not translated now, I hope that's the exact kind of thing that is going to happen over this next decade. Um, I do have. I, my own geopolitical reasons for believing that um, India is going to become closer and closer with the United States uh, in the next 10 years and the UK. Uh, and I hope that leads to more cultural exchange books like that, not going untranslated. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, William, uh, yes. Nina ma'am has given the name and guess who is the author? It is Dr. S.A. Dange. I kind of was wondering if that was what was going to be. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dange's uh, uh, lot of previous work was based on uh, title Sexual Symbolism in Indian Mythology. And what was that in Indian mythology? Sexual Symbolism in Indian Mythology. Mm. And so mm. there he, ha he had connected all those uh, metaphors and everything. How sexualism can be seen in agriculture and myths associated with the same culture. And, uh, but it was a bit difficult to be accepted at that time period. People within India were not uh, opening up to these uh, different ideas. But, uh, you know, somewhere down the line, Dr. S.A. Dange's theories uh, were taken up by uh, Wendy Donega. Mm -hmm. And it, it went a bit in a different direction. So we know about right. it, like Wendy Doniger considers Dr. Dange as her uh, mentor. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, there is one question from Paran Sivam. One, one second, let me, let me respond yeah. to one other thing Nina said first, because it said something up that's very interesting. You, mm -hmm. uh, Nina, you referenced um, uh, a solar example where, where somebody had looked at solar myths around the world, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm really interested in is some people, when we get to the hero's journey, what, you, what we find is that some people, some mythologists have wanted to say that this myth is solar, it's about the solar cycle, or this myth is lunar, it's about the lunar cycle. I think that that does happen sometimes, but I believe, and this is my perspective, that actually they're always really the cycle of the soul. 
and that they're only using the solar cycle to set up a metaphor to refer back to the soul and the same with the moon. And so that what actually happens is you often find layers of the solar and the agricultural and the lunar. And sometimes you don't see the whole solar myth and you don't see the whole lunar myth and you don't see, but you see elements of all of them, of the seasons of life and death, of sexuality, of birth. And I think the reason why you often see more of a mixture of these and, and even when you see something that's truly solar, you see other stuff too. I think it's because all of those, it's not about anchoring the myth around the solar cycle. It's about anchoring the myth around the human cycle and using all of nature's cycles to reflect off of that. And so that way it's more abstract uh, than any one of them. Uh, and so this is one of the things I think is a little bit different about my work and a previous generation of work because a previous generation of work was, as far as I can tell, enabled to, set, to, to go beyond uh, trying to reductively pick a cycle that was the cycle that was informing a myth. And, and I'm trying, yeah. Yes, and Dr. Lin, um, just if you permit me, I, I, I keep a dream journal because I was trained oh, okay. in dream analysis and I, I'm not going to the details, but in the subconscious mind too carries these kind of things. And so that's your theory, how we are ingrained or we are, you know, seasoned, what shall I say, conditioned into thinking. But think about it, a lot of the uh, symbols that we see in our dream, because when we record our dream, we are supposed to record the action, the place, uh, the emotions, and there is a fourth thing. So often when I do this analysis, I find that a lot of this stuff that you're talking happens to be there i mean it's it's mm. very bizarre but it happens in our dreams also so you know it's a psyche playing there that's all i just wanted to say that's all thank you and i couldn't agree more 100 percent. and and i don't know if you were with me uh for the last uh, one of these i did with sunil and in, in mythology classroom i focused a lot on dream and i think that you know that is uh i one of the most interesting things is that you know when it we probably won't get this far into the presentation this time, probably next time, but when we get to Jung, which I'm sure, who I'm sure you've engaged, it sounds like, you know, his pattern of individuation, where he's saying, you know, we go through these cycles uh, in our dreams. These, our dreams are helping us grow. They're leading us through a journey of, of falling, of dying and being reborn into ourselves and, and using these metaphors. Um, later, Campbell would be primarily influenced by the individuation journey. And so beneath the hero's journey, which is beneath all these movies, uh, really the individuation is pronounced. Uh, and of course, the individuation was built on the study of dreams first and foremost. Uh, so dreams are uh, sometimes unspoken, but, but really the, the foundation of a lot of this work. Uh, because you see, that's where you see the mind make connections that you didn't mean for it to make. That's where you see its own connections without consciously saying, oh, I think the sun's like the sunrise. Maybe, but if it happens in your dream automatically, it's telling you that your imagination has connected them and you can trust that in a different way. There was another question, Sunil, who, who was the other question? So, uh, thank you, Nina, ma'am. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, the next question is from Vedavati. Now, this is very interesting name. You know, we were just talking about the Vedas previously and the name is Vedavati, just like the Vedas. And um, I had told you, we, we have, we today have participant uh, who is teacher of psychology. So there it is, there she is, Vedwati. And oh. it, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion, great question. Please, Vedwati, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, I'm thoroughly enjoying so far the discussion as the presentation. Uh, I just had one curiosity actually talk about the cycle of day. So like day, night and sunrise, sunset and all. Uh, I, I feel very curious about the, uh, you know, period in between. That is when there is sunset, but yet it's not completely dark. So night has not set in the period of dusk. And similarly, there is a period of dawn where just the little uh, maybe sunrise is there, but then yet it's not completely light. 
and uh, it is it is seen or it is at least you know traditionally believed in the time of dust one tends to feel restless one tends to feel upset and you know all the troublesome feelings might surface and there are rituals in indian uh, tradition that you know you should pray to god at that time or like you know you try to calm your mind by praying god and everything and similarly at the time of dawn one typically i mean may not be generalized but then i feel that you know one feels um, uh, uh, pleasant one feels happy one feels like you know hopeful so uh, can we call this also this uh, like you know this emotion period at the time of day these two times of the day uh, can we call them also kind of thing that they go they move around like in cycle you you broke up just a little bit right there can we call them what Oh, uh, the last last part. You said, "Can we call them?" Uh, and then I. Hello. Can yeah, can me? we call them a uh, cycle or uh, like you know, hello? Yeah, can, can am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, am I, I think audible? I think we've got a delayed echo. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, like, can we call them? Uh, call these things also like the emotions which are generated at these two times. Can we also call them cyclical, moving in a cycle? Like, you know, feeling happy or hopeful at the dawn, and then feeling upset or restless at the time of dusk. Ah, uh, I see. The question. Thank you. Thank you. And and I think that uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, I think you're pushing in exactly the direction that I want to go. That. By being con being inside of these cycles, it starts to really affect us. And and if I and if I and you were breaking up a little bit, but I think I followed. You know, when you're talking about the the emotions that we have, for example, when we go from sunset to full darkness, and if there's a consistency uh, in the human emotional response to uh, these these moments, you know, what does that say? Is that and I I think that's that's dead on and and really really exactly it is that um, we start to have psychological emotional biological responses to these cycles and of course it's not just like cognitive i mean it, we know menstrual cycles or hormone cycles or uh uh what do we call them um uh what are the main uh circadian rhythms right we have major chemical and psychological reactions to these cycles uh, that become psychological, that become cognitive. Uh, some people, you know, one of my friends who I, I won't name his name, but a guy that I do a lot of this work with, he avoids uh, important engagements three days up to the full moon because he just knows, he's noticed in his life that he's always a little on edge uh, as, as the moon approaches the full moon. Um, there was a second part of what you were talking about that was really valuable to a thing I like to talk about too. And I hope I, I did justice to what you were saying uh, and bringing up. Um, the second part that I'm really interested in is you talk about the gap between sun setting and full darkness and the gap between the first little bit of light and sunrise. And so sometimes when I draw these diagrams, especially when I'm doing that for a storyteller and showing, helping a storyteller set up a, a diagram to write their story, I don't just have a line. If you can see my mouse here, I have a double line. So that, for example, when Alice goes down the rabbit hole, she's not just, she doesn't just go through a portal and end up on the other side. There's a gap between entering the rabbit hole and coming out of the rabbit hole. And that gap, uh, in mythic terms, we call it liminal space. That's between things. So, for example, another example I like in movies, in Jurassic Park, they decide we're gonna go to Jurassic Park, right? The, the two archeologists. So they clink their glasses. And from that moment, they're in their helicopter and they're traveling. But they don't just show up all of a sudden there. They go through a gate after a gate after a gate. They fly over water, they fly over the land, they come in. The, and so the point is, is that they don't just cross the threshold and end up there. There's a, there's a double line, like you're saying, from sunset to darkness. And in that gap, in that double line is in stories what they call a liminal space uh, and very interesting space. And of course, you know, we, we talk about dusk, we talk about twilight as a time where liminal and interesting things can happen. Halloween, uh, Halloween in the Celtic calendar, Samhain, actually is that day of the year. It's the day of the year that you might associate with nine o'clock p.m., not sunset, full darkness. 
So that's why Halloween isn't on the fall equinox. Halloween is between the fall equinox and the winter solstice when things are actually in the darker part of the year. So why Halloween? What's so interesting about that is that Halloween fundamentally is about a thin boundary between the world below and the world we're in. And that what happens on, while we're in this thin boundary, what happens is that this is the night when the dead can come back, right? This is the night when, when uh, we can get messages from the other side during these twilight hours, uh, during this gap time. And of course, the, the Grail Castle in, in Arthurian legend exists in this space between life and death, in this space between light and dark, uh, where, where things can travel. So uh, sometimes we simplify the diagrams like a, like a scientist that simplifies a diagram of an electron and a proton, and we all know that that's not really even close to what it looks like, but they needed to draw it in 2D. So in this case, this is oversimplified, and you have pointed to another layer of complexity that I really believe is there, a double line in most cases. So thank you. Um, so let's make a choice. I've got about uh, 15 minutes left or so. Uh, I think, let me show you guys just a little bit about Oedipus, and then I hope that you're interested and we can keep going uh, for a another session. So where we are right now, this is kind of the overlay, what you're looking at of, of the extended conversation. So we've looked at the natural cycles and this is gonna set us up to see the natural cycles and some major myths. So see, these are some of the major myths I wanna see it in. Um, Oedipus, Osiris, Inanna, Persephone, Christ, and the Buddha. And then the theories, then some films and, and some models that are more specifically about filmmaking. So let's look at some myths. And uh, I'll try and make sure that I only do a quick version of this uh, so that we can have some time for some conversation. So uh, some of you know the riddle of the Sphinx. I'm gonna tell you the riddle so that you can think about it before I give you the answer. Question is, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, uh, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening? And so if you don't know the riddle, think about it for a second, I'll give you a moment. Here we have an image. This, this riddle is from Oedipus Rex, which is argued potentially the most famous play in, in Greek, in the history of Greece, in the history of the classical world, in the history of the Western world, arguably. So this riddle is pretty central. So what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, three legs in the evening? So we have the answer, William. Yeah. So, Lisbeth, uh, would you like to share the answer, please? Oh dear, is it a challenge? No, I'm, yeah, I can share it, but I mean, the, the lecturer can tell it. I mean, I know this. No, please, go ahead. Well, it is human being. I mean, on four legs as a baby and on two legs in the prime of life and with a stick in old life, in old age. So. Excellent. So. What I find so interesting about this is that here we are in probably one of the most famous plays of all time. The riddle that defines the play is aligning the solar cycle with the human life cycle in its very riddle. And this is what I'm saying is the tendency of early great writers. They want to do it. They can't help it. So not only do we have this cycle aligning the baby in the solar cycle, the life cycle in the solar cycle, but this is also uh, the cycle of the play. This is the story structure of the play. So the play begins with Oedipus as a baby, and then he becomes an, 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 on four legs, cast out in the morning, and then he becomes an adult on two legs, and he kills his father, uh, who is the... Well, that's related to the story too. He's the, the father symbolizes the high son, uh, but that's another story. Um, but then ultimately he gets old in the story and he becomes, uh, and there's a, oh, where's my quote? I, I'm not in my presenter view, but the, the quote is basically at the very beginning of the story, um, the blind uh, poet uh, says basically that this is gonna happen, that, that Oedipus, you're gonna end up uh, with a cane, blind and with a cane, so here we have the story structure, not just the riddle, but the story structure of the play follows uh, the solar pattern. Okay, and then 
But now what about the poking out of the eyes? Oedipus pokes out his eyes when he has a cane. Now I'm gonna just, you know, so can you imagine what would poking out the eyes be at sunset? It's almost an annoying question, it's so obvious, right? Of course, it's the sunset. <laughs> the eye goes out at sunset. Well, wait a minute, is that a global motif? Does that happen all over the place? That seems like that would happen all over the place. Oh yeah, it definitely happens all over the place. So Orion, if you look up and you see Orion, who I hope we keep in our sky for all of our lifetime, I don't know if you guys know, but one of the stars in Orion's, one of Orion's hands uh, is looking like it could burn out. So it could get huge, like as bright as the moon almost, and then be gone in our lifetime is what they're saying. And that would be very sad to me to have an incomplete Orion in my lifetime. But anyway, Orion, you guys all know the constellation, I believe it's that the big man in the sky with the three, the little belt, the three stars of the belt. I am sure that it's a different constellation for you. In fact, Sunil, can you tell me real quick, is, is that what that's called for you guys? I might be a miss, oh, there you go. Sorry, sorry, William, I didn't get your question. The, do you know the constellation Orion, what it is, what you, what you guys call that constellation? May uh, I? May yeah, I? please, please. Please, please. Um, Betelgeuse is Ardra Nakshatra, one of the 27 Nakshatras, and Orion as a whole has many roles from the Veda onwards, and it is, among other things, uh, imagined as the dancing Shiva, but also other forms of Shiva and also forms of Vishnu. So Excellent. there was evolution there. I really need to know more about that. Uh, yeah, the Murga Nakshatra, that is, that is what this other person says. That is, it, is, it is also Murga. And it is, um, but that is not uh, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is Ardra. But there is discussion about that. I mean, there are also people who say that it might be a slightly different star. But at the moment, Betelgeuse is considered to be Ardra. So what's so interesting about, uh, about what you're saying is that you're talking about some of the biggest myths, uh, Shiva, biggest figures, uh, Shiva, Vishnu being seen in that constellation. Uh, and mm -hmm. the same is true in Egyptian mythology. They see it yeah. as Osiris. Uh, it's the big man in the sky. It's the one who dances through the night. And so the myth of Orion, many people don't know this in the Western world, but and the myth of Orion is his eyes are stabbed out. He does this thing where he's like, it's that whole story where the farmer, he stays with the farmer. The farmer is like, you can stay here, but don't touch my daughter. And then of course, Orion seduces the daughter. Actually, no, Orion rapes the daughter. And then the father gets angry and the father gets him drunk and then stabs out his eyes. And then Orion goes and prays to his, uh, to his friend um, uh, Vulcan, Hephaestus. And Hephaestus says, sends Kedalion, who's a little dwarf. And Kedalion sits on Orion's shoulder. And Orion is told, walk to the sunrise and watch the sunrise. And while he watches the sunrise, his eyes come back. So there we have it. So just like we have the eye being poked out for Oedipus at sunset or in old age uh, associated with sunset, here we have the eye coming back with the sunrise for Orion. And then if we, this is an expansion of this. So in Egyptian mythology, for example, uh, Horus's eye is stabbed out at the sunset and comes back in the sunrise. And we can look at a whole lot of myths of eyes going out and coming back and connect them with the going out of a celestial light on the horizon and the coming back of the celestial light uh, with the sunrise. Okay, so the other piece there is the journey through the night, uh, um, which I think, let's stay a little focused. I think that might take us a little far for now to be able to get into some stuff. I'm looking at our time and I wanna make sure we have some time to talk. Um, so let me uh, end with uh, this myth. This is probably my personal favorite myth to obsess over, the myth of Osiris. And the reason why, Osiris and, uh, and um, Inanna, of course. And the reason why is because it is a monomyth in and of itself. So what you see with the, the life and death of Osiris is also the life and death of the sun, sunrise and sunset. But it's also the life and death of the, um, of the pharaoh, of the, the uh, uh, regime, but it's also the cycle of the year. It's, so what you start to see is the cycle of the moon as well. So what you start to see is that the Egyptians with the myth of Osiris, intentionally or not, have lined up waking and sleeping, uh, living and dying, 
sexuality and procreation. And so what you see here in, in this diagram is, is beginning to demonstrate uh, the translation of all these patterns we were looking at earlier into the Egyptian myth. They lay them all down together, or many of them together. And I think actually, let's actually start with that one if we do this uh, another round. And let me show you a little bit more approachable version of, of, the, of these things. So here are, skipping over, okay. Now, this is an easier one. I'm gonna show a few. Here's Christ, sunset, burial in the cave, sunrise, exit from the cave in the morning. This is the journey into the underworld and back. And this is Jesus. Here's Persephone. She plucks a flower, the earth splits up. Um, Hades takes her into the underworld. He gives her his seed, which is his semen. And then she comes back in the spring, leaving the cave. So again, just like Jesus, into the cave of death, out of the cave of death, associated with sunrise. And for her, it's especially associated with the seasons. So when she goes into the underworld, it's the beginning, it's fall. This is the harvest, right? She plucks the flower, just like we harvest the grain. This is the fall. This is death. And then she's gonna go into the underworld, become impregnated and come back. And this will be spring. This is the same story with Inanna. Inanna goes into the underworld of death and will come back. But Inanna has great details. So Inanna actually, when she comes back, she's in birth. From the bottom to the return, she's in labor. Her return from the underworld is synchronized with her birth of her child. You see the alignment of the cycles we talked about earlier, life and death, but also procreation. So literally her rebirth will be synchronized with the birth of her child. But there's another one that I'm especially interested in with Inanna. First of all, you see this picture down here? This picture is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. It's way older than Jesus. That picture right there of Inanna on the cross in the underworld where she hangs for three nights, just like Jesus in the underworld for three nights. Okay, so why three nights? Well, look at this little symbol above her. You see this little crescent? Let's talk about that crescent for a second. So remember we said that the very, 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 very bottom of the cycle is the last sliver of moon? And the beginning, the first new spark of light is the first sliver of moon. That's what we're seeing right here. That represents, that sliver right there represents both the last sliver of moon and the first sliver of moon. This is often why you see that crescent moon on soldiers' uh, uh, foreheads from samurai to Irish Celtic warriors. That is the symbol of both death and rebirth. The sickle of death, the last sliver of light, the last light's going out is a symbol of death and the sickle sword that cuts off that last little bit of light, symbol of death, the first little bit of light, the crescent, the grail, the vessel, the bowl, the cup of that first new light, symbol of regeneration. And they both symbolize that crucial moment, the last little bit of light and the first little bit of light. And in between are three dark nights. The new moon stays pretty dark in between these nights. And then more, and also the winter solstice, they say you can't visually tell that the light has changed directions for three nights. So it looks like the world is just paused for three nights of the darkest day. So now let's go back to this little crescent. So this little crescent uh, in the myth, she says to people, if I, if, if I don't come back, somebody save me, right? And the only person that responds is her maternal grandfather. And the maternal grandfather, uh, when the, her helper goes to him and says, you got to save Inanna, the queen, she's in the underworld. He just casually takes a little bit of dirt from under his thumbnail. And the, what's the thumbnail? This is, of course, the moon. And this is what we see above her. A little bit of in God's thumbnail. I'm, I'm, you know, you see that, for example, there's a Disney movie called uh, Angels in the Outfield. And in that movie, the little kid calls the moon God's thumbnail. 
And the point is, is that whether it's today for a Disney movie or 5,000 freaking years ago for a myth of Inanna, we can still see God's thumbnail on the crescent moon. So here God takes a little bit of dirt from under his thumbnail and he makes two little creatures from that dirt. And those two creatures take Inanna, the bread of life and the water of life. And she is revived. And so you see that her revival is symbolized by this little first crescent that is the carrier of the little bit of water and the little bit, it's the communion, right? Like Jesus, the wine and the bread of life. So they take her, the elixir of life, the bread of life, she changes direction. So really importantly, this little crescent symbolizes her change of direction from the bottom back upward. And it also, remember, represents her womb. The crescent moon represents her womb because she is now going into labor. The second she receives that little bit of water and that little bit of bread that comes from the crescent moon, she's going into labor. Okay, so the point here is, is we see the cycle of life and death. We see the cycle of the lunar cycle. We see them line up with her myth of not just death and resurrection, but also procreation. And you start to see the visual metaphors of the moon and of these cycles start to come in. Now, I'm probably going to leave the Buddha out of this one, but one thing that I always love, somebody mentioned his first sermon. I always think of his first sermon as when he kind of comes out, when he comes back, right? And when he cuts his hair, that's when he leaves. That's when his journey begins, right? But that cutting of the hair moment and the departure it's hard to separate from Persephone plucking the flower at her departure. This is the cutting of the grain at the departure of the year into the winter. Now, I know I'm, I'm in dangerous waters making these kind of connections, uh, and I hope that's okay. Uh, and, and I, you know, um, and the same thing with the return. But let's focus really on the obviousness of Inanna literally going into the world of the dead and back. Persephone into the world of the dead and back, Jesus into the world of dead and back. And for Jesus, the emphasis is on life and death with some solar and, uh, you know, day and night stuff. With Persephone, the emphasis is on the spring, but also with procreation and death. With Inanna, the emphasis is on procreation, uh, but also with some emphasis on the moon. And the point is, and I'm going to end this back here. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, uh, all the way up. Oh right there. And the point is, is that what we just looked at is how these myths, which are way later than the conditioning of these cycles are naturally happening to the human body and human psyche. These myths, by the time the biggest myths of our world, Christ, Inanna, Persephone, Osiris, the biggest myths, some of the very biggest myths we have, naturally just tend to line up, not with the solar cycle, not with the lunar cycle, but with the cycle beneath those cycles, with the pattern beneath them. That's why they're not reductively solar or reductively lunar or reductively any of these things. There's an underlying pattern, an underlying cycle. And where I'll end is just say that where this goes is eventually we're gonna see these cycles and myths. We're gonna see mythologists start to make sense of these cycles. And then we're gonna see films start to copy these cycles. And then we're gonna see theorists copy the films, copying the theories, copying the myths, copying nature. <laughs> so that by the time a screenwriting teacher is telling somebody to use the hero's journey, their students don't have a clue that what they're really telling them to do is to introduce the world to the cycles of nature. And that by telling a movie with the hero's journey, you're actually connecting the audience to the solar cycle. The writers don't have a clue. And one of my missions as a screenwriting teacher, as a film teacher, who is also a mythologist, is to make sure that when we teach the hero's journey and when we teach screenplay models, that our writers know that these models are actually anchored all the way back to these patterns of life and death and sex and procreation and consciousness. And I believe that their stories will be more powerful if they can do that. And I believe that we as mythologists will be more effective at making sense of the meaning and power and depth of, of new movies when we can see the connection of the cycles all the way from nature to our story structures. And if we continue, that's where we'll go. I'll, I'll share some more of these myths. We'll go into some more of these theories and I'll show you more about how these myths translate uh, into our movies uh, and into our popular culture. 
Uh, and I'll stop there and uh, look forward to any questions or thoughts or comments or criticisms. Uh, certainly a working, a working development here. So thank you all uh, for listening. Um, uh, look forward to, to any of your thoughts. Thank you. First, let me just say thank you, Sunil. Thank yes. you for that. Uh, and thank you to everyone for participating. And, and it's an honor and a pleasure and a delight to, to get to do this. Uh, Sunil, you're doing a great thing by doing this. I hope I can help you any way I can. And, um, you know, I hope that this is only the beginning. Uh, and I hope that um, we continue to find ways to, you know, Sunil knows that uh, I, I run events that are not totally dissimilar from this in Southern California. And we've been brainstorming ways to introduce all of you with the people that are going to those events in Southern California, because we're all mythology, we're all interested in mythology. You know, and, and it's a difficult time change. We keep inviting Sunil to give an event to our group, and we want to invite all of you to come to that. But the timing is difficult, and we're going to keep working at it. But the point is, is that we want to find, we want to continue to open this relationship wider and wider and wider. Uh, and, and I hope uh, all of you are as grateful as I am uh, for Sunil. Thank you for, for doing this work. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Lin, may I ask? Please. Uh, I refer to your second slide and in which you have mentioned Buddha. Uh, uh -huh, yeah. My question is, how come I see the Krishna missing there? And there's a good reason to ask. There is a book uh, by Dr. S.R. Goyal, The Religious History of India. And hmm. it seems that as per the Western thought, the story of Krishna is copied from Christ. There are a lot of similarities that they are born, he's born in the stable and stuff like that and similar things. And uh, interestingly, this theory was accepted by some of the scholars in India. So hmm. uh, I'm sure you know about Krishna. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so oh. it's missing there. So I was just wondering. Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's, it's only because um, uh, lack of depth, you know, I, I would like to continue to do this with more and more and more figures to compare them with these patterns. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of uh, not having done it yet, you know, and uh, the Buddha, I happen to kind of see how some of these things could connect. Uh, but it would be I would absolutely love um, to do the same thing with Krishna. Um, and and more figures. And I would love to hear more about the connections with Krishna and Christ. Uh, and I'm going to have to go get a pen because I'm learning from you guys. One second. Oh, I've got one. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it should be there. Uh, definitely. Um, and I would love for there to be a Krishna slide in this work. And, um, and I don't need to monopolize the work either. If anybody else sees how that fits and wants to share it with me, I would be infinitely appreciative. Thank you, because largely Krishna has been a mythical figure, according to some. It's a very interesting stuff. Half the people think it never existed. So much mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, these uh, things in these mysterious books that we have on the Christianity side about mm -hmm. uh, Christ's mother and the, the scroll and stuff like that, you know, in which these historical books are written, um, Da Vinci and stuff like that. So it's very similar, you know. So. Yeah, and, and let me just make one comment, and, and I know I want to get to as many questions as possible, but one, one quick comment on that, because uh, the relationship, somebody, you mentioned the Golden Bough earlier, right? And when the yeah. Golden Bough came out, and Sunil talked about how uh, Dr. Dange's work wasn't initially received very well, and that there's this tension between a religious consciousness that needs to see these stories as literally having happened, and a mythological consciousness that right. sees them as symbolic. And I think that there is a false belief that they can't be both. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, that I, I believe, because I, I, do, I do believe in, in more than a secular world, I believe in things. And so I believe um, that there can be a relationship between the symbolic and the literal that something literal can happen that is deeply symbolic and something symbolic can happen in the literal world. And so maybe, maybe not, there's a real Jesus. Maybe, maybe not, there's a real Krishna. But talking about it as symbolic does not disqualify the possibility that it was literal. And that's just something I want to I wanna say because I think it's very important. Uh, yeah. Sunil, can I ask a question? Uh, sorry, please. Yeah. Uh, 
a good uh, I, I i should say i don't know what good evening uh, uh, professor william uh, thank you for your uh, beautiful lecture thank you hello yeah uh, uh, i wanted to know see there are so many rituals especially tribals that they usually dance after sunset to midnight mm -hmm. but also uh, certain other religions will not have any important ritual between sunset and uh, midnight i'd also like to add up just one point which i wanted to add in indian mythology there is a story of nachiketas and uh, nachiketas father he you know his father gets angry because he is doing a yagna or a sacrifice and nachiketas keeps disturbing him and keeps asking him what are you going to put in the sacrifice altar next and the father gets very angry and he says i'm going to put you and then he uh, <coughs> following the father's wor uh, word he goes to yama the god of death and he waits there for three nights and yama cannot take him because his time has not come and then he says go back to your father he says i won't go back until i know the secret of what happens to the soul after death so again it's like he goes to death and comes back with the eternal knowledge and here also the reference is exactly three nights yeah wonderful wow wow um well enough said on the second one i think that's just beautiful and on the first part about the dancing from sunset to midnight um i love those stories the and i, I actually am working with a musician uh, named young bay uh and this musician I'm helping him make a comic book. And one of the comic book, and what I'm working on with is an adaptation of a fairy tale. And the fairy tale is the fairy tale of princesses disappearing every night, but coming back with worn out dance shoes. And what they find, what the main character of the story finds is that the princesses are sneaking off to the underworld to dance all night and come back. And so you see this motif. And, and one of the things about this, why do we dance at night? And, and differently than, than we walk in the day, you know, dancing at night is pretty common compared. And I think it's because there's an alternate consciousness. You know, there's, there's the solar consciousness of logic and reason and do what you're supposed to and, and all that stuff. Dance is free. Dance is, dancing is a symbolic expression of a different consciousness. It's more like dream consciousness than math. It's like waking consciousness, you know? And so I think that's a beautiful part of why dance is often connected with the underworld because it, it moves with a different modality, a musical modality. Uh, and um, so thank you for bringing up uh, that, those rituals. And one of the things that we'll look at, by the way, uh, next time, I hope, is um, one of the, we look at a guy named Van Gennep. And Van Gennep is a ritual studies scholar. And Gennep looks at rituals, everything from coming of age rituals, weddings, death, funerals, all kinds of rituals, right? And he's trying to see, well, is there any, anything consistent with all these rituals around the world, different types? And he finds, uh, and we'll talk about that more, but really quickly, uh, the three steps he finds uh, are something like, first, you separate from who you were, then you initiate into who you're becoming, and then you return with who you've become, needing to insist that you actually have changed and this is actually who you are and you got to get the world to accept you for this, right? So the separation, initiation, return uh in the rituals and so the ritual is an essential layer to doing this study uh in an hour-long session i left the rituals out a little bit but the rituals are a beautiful and important layer to studying these patterns um and i hope we get to talk about that more thank you uh, thank you thank you thank you Subhas, sir. Uh, thank you william uh, next question is from pubali uh, i hope uh, ma'am i'm pronouncing the name correctly uh, yes that's correct Yes. Ma'am, uh, William, it would be interesting for you to know that ma'am is from, from background of screenwriting. Oh, great. Hi, hi. Thank you for your session. This, was, uh, this has been really informative. Some of which is reiteration of what we study in the hero's journey and stuff like that, but it's a new way oh. to look at it. Uh, I have a specific kind of question, if you can help me understand that the circles that you were, the, the diagrams that you were showing, uh, regarding the sequencing of it, the chronology of it, because we're going from summer, spring, winter, fall. 
and so in couple of myths that you're that you were describing it feels like the story starts from where fall is or what would be copulation or fall dead that phase of the cycle and then it's mm -hmm. kind of going anti clockwise and that's i just want to hear your thoughts on this i mean yeah, so my polar opposites it's not a sequence that i would follow like conscious wake up dream fall dead that kind of doesn't kind of make general sense but oh so you're going just, opposite direction right so it's kind of so, moving anti clockwise that's the sequencing right, right. So, so what i would say is that actually um this i'm going the opposite direction uh not not the story going the other direction so i don't i don't go from summer to spring to winter to fall that would be backwards right right so what i'm what I'm doing is I'm drawing the direction of going from summer to fall to winter to spring. I'm drawing that in the counterclockwise direction. So, that, right. so we're, we're still so, going but, in the right way. But when we go for story structure, if I'm to study story structure, are you saying, are you saying we, we're starting from where? From the full summer hmm. conscious stage? Or well, are we starting? The hero's any, journey. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, so two things about the clockwise thing and where we start. And so the hero's journey, most people's relationship with the hero's journey comes from Christopher Vogler. And Christopher Vogler, uh, who I present with and work with, uh, Christopher Vogler's book, um, he has the hero's journey going clockwise. Joseph Campbell has it going counterclockwise for, in my right. opinion, uh, right. more profound reasons why it's going counterclockwise. Uh, I don't like the clockwise direction, uh, personally, and this would be probably one of the few places where I, I don't line up with Chris Vogler, uh, who's a good friend, and I like working with him, and I think his model has been really valuable. Right. Uh, so um, why do I go counterclockwise? It's different than Campbell. Campbell goes counterclockwise because he says it's about going against the grain, that the hero doesn't go with the flow, the hero goes against the flow. You know? right. But from my reasoning, my reasoning is that... Um, I'm showing a lot of sunrise and sunset type of stuff. And right. so if you look at a map, if you just look at a map, you know, east is always on the right and west right. is always on the left. And so to me, if I had to flip it around, that means I'd have to be putting east on the right and west on the left. And, I, and so to me, it's more or intuitive uh, to one, stick with Campbell's way of doing it and two, um, to right. do it in a way lines up with this so because so you're also following the light cycle and that makes sense that way right okay and the second question of why does where to start um you know campbell always starts at the top chris vogler always starts at the top and the reason why they start and so i think that different types of stories start in different places and finish in different places so right. for example um a bill dunes roman a coming of age story a coming right. of age story is fundamentally from sunrise to noon Yes. And right. so, but what happens is, is that when they do the coming of age stories these days, they still give them the full circle. <laughs> uh, they give them the full circle and they give them just that first quarter. Right. Uh, which they now you have two layers going. But uh, so there's one. And then the other is like when it comes to Oedipus, Oedipus's story goes from sunrise to sunset. And yes. in my opinion, uh, Jung is, a, is especially focused from noon to midnight but the hero's journey uh is especially focused uh on what what Jung calls the second half of life you know after your midlife crisis this isn't about becoming a strong adult this is about yeah. after you've already become a normal effective healthy functioning individual and you realize that's not enough you realize now it's time for the real journey to, to really integrate that's part of myself that i left out to get here uh, and that's definitely, we'll go deep into the hero's journey more, uh, hopefully next time. But, um, but both Campbell and Vogler start at the very top because that's the place where you fall from. That's the normal world. That's the, right. that's the flow that needs to be deconstructed. Um, and I think, you know, I would love to go deeper into this conversation. Uh, and I hope that that somewhat began to satisfy some of the questions that I know go deeper for you. Um, no, yeah. but this has been good. This has been really illuminating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, uh, I'll say, um, uh, by the way, I'm working on the Joseph Campbell Foundation is putting out a book on Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is the book where the hero's journey comes from, as you know. Yes. Uh, yes. They're putting out a study guide. And so they've asked me to be the author of their study guide uh, because I work with it so much to teach it and stuff like that. 
So right. we'll be coming out with a study guide on Here with a Thousand Faces sometime in the next 12 months. Um, I'm this, sure that's going to be a really helpful resource. Especially I hope so. for screenwriting students, yes. And, and teachers, right? I'm hoping it's yes. especially helpful for screenwriting teachers that, you know, they're right. pulling the video from the web and that video from the web. How about something official from the Campbell Foundation that has peer-reviewed oversight from a whole team of mythologists that want to make sure it's good and reliable? <laughs> uh, right, that's yes, that should be really useful, yes. We'll make sure that you get a, a pre-published copy. Oh, that will be really good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you and good luck with that book. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sunil, could I come with my uh, yes. reaction? Yes. Uh, so uh, just before that, William, congrats for the, that news. You are going to be author for a guidebook. All the best Thank for you. that. And uh, Elizabeth, ma'am, please ask your question. Yeah, I, I have been um, um, connected with India a lot deeply and studied the mythology and especially in the astronomical aspects of Indian mythology. And there are so many layers, but I mean, the astrology is the one, the astronomy is the one that kind of got me. Uh, now through the day, we, the sun moves in one direction and then through the year, it moves in the opposite direction. And then in the great year, it moves again in the opposite direction. And when you look at Indian mythology and the festivals, like we talk about Guru Purnima, Guru Purnima is also celebrated as Dakshinayana, the moment that the sun, that the solstice, that the sun goes south. But mm. I mean, that's three weeks ago. And then in Tamil Nadu, there's a festival in the beginning of August when they celebrate uh, summer solstice. And these are, uh, are dates that refer to thousands and thousands of years ago. And I call it a kind of mythological archaeology because the Indian traditions and the Indian mythology, they have preserved all these different layers also from like 1500 years ago, three and a half thousand years ago and, and so on and so forth. And that's why I was laughing about uh, that the idea that uh, the Christ story would have uh, informed the Krishna story because I think there is a connection, but it's the other way around because everything mm. in India is a lot older than we hmm. realize at the moment. But um, yeah, so, Thank so you. yeah, that is one of those uh, mechanisms that you see in India all the time. That's my, so yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually kind of a crazy person. These circles you see, man, I can spend hours, days, months, <laughs> years, just, just evap, just, just wasting away, looking at these patterns and trying to find them. Yeah. And you're introducing two more layers that I've not worked with and that I instantly would like to assimilate and, and explore uh, with the long year and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, that's very well, you, interesting. Yeah, some of the things you said about the eye thing, there is a mythology connected to the dancing Shiva in which the whole thing about the eyes. And I think your, uh, your perspective may have finally kind of decoded that because all these myths to me, it's all code. So mm -hmm. um, part of it, of course, is psychological. It's the, uh, the journey of the soul but it's 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 also scientific it's also astronomy and um the indian rich rites the vedic rites are also astronomical so there's always this interaction between different layers of meaning well so, anyway wonderful to um, to participate here thank I you i had a great time thank you and likewise and and uh you know i i want to comment on the value and opportunity. I know Sunil, one of his goals is to make sure to preserve, help preserve um, some of the heritage that uh, that can be lost, old stories and that kind of thing. And, and um, Yeah, the, the past 70 years, so much has been lost in India and I've seen it happen. And with my late partner, we were kind of involved in that, trying to save something because he was connected mm -hmm. to the one of the great in South Indian temples. And, and we were almost helpless because in India at that time, nobody was interested. So mm. at least something is changing, but I can't, um, you can't imagine how much has been lost the past 70 years, actually since independence. But oh, um, well, there's a lot of people now. I mean, people are waking up, but, but I mean, all the Brahmins moved to America, you know, and, and in South India, the temples lie, uh, the temple chariots lie in the mud because there's no more money and, and the people have mm. left. There's, it's, 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 yeah, there are no words that, for that. 
Yeah, it's certainly not. And, and you know, I, I, from a mythological point of view, just a scholarly point of view, it's absolutely invaluable, you know, to, because in my opinion, so, so for example, I mentioned that yesterday is 4th of July and the nation country, the United States biggest national holiday. And then 4th of July is always on or next to the Amphelion, the, the day that the, the high point of the earth from the sun. To me, that seems intentional. It's like, of course, the, the United States would declare its national holiday the high point. It's, it's so American. And, uh, but the point is, is that Americans don't have a clue of the relationship. You know, d Christians don't have a clue that, Chris that, that, um, that Christmas is connected with the winter solstice next to the winter solstice, three days after the winter solstice. So the relationship of the West, you know, we, I, I think about it in terms of like, you know, it, what happens when somebody is using a clock in outer space and they're now in a distant galaxy, but they're still using a 24 hour clock and they have no idea what sunrise is anymore, but they're just using a clock without meaning. And I think that the West has really gone that direction in a devastating way where they've lost the meaning beneath their own patterns. And I think that there is a deep desire to re-explore and re-engage the meaning in our patterns uh, as part of what I care to be doing. And I think that what you're saying where, you know, there's a ritual engagement with astrology and astronomy and festivals and this kind of uh, full connection between everything from from yoga and the body to uh, relationship with the heavens on certain th this type of interconnectivity of the layers of human engagement is actually something I think that the West is lost so badly and wants back so badly and I think that uh, that I hope that that less and less and less is lost more is gained and that more can be shared and that that relationship uh, can inform uh, those who want to go back in that direction. Um, part of why I play with these cycles is because I feel more connected to the cosmos when I see them and I think about them. And I think most of us feel so disconnected. I think that defines the modern secular modality, disconnection, uh, feeling of uh, estrangement and isolation. So anyway, so thank you for sharing that. And I, and I am very hopeful that... Um, uh, more interest that we share, that we demonstrate like this will only lead to more, more uh, care for the types of things we're talking about, more preservation uh, and more sharing. Thank you, William. Uh, many, many people have asked me about your uh, email ID. So I have mm -hmm. asked them to visit mythosophia.net so they can get a lot of content over there as well as they will get your contact info over there. I'm not sure my contact info is over there. Um, I don't mind putting my email address. Uh, I'll type it into here. Um, I will say that anybody that don't hate me if I'm not super quick in my response, but I will respond to anybody who writes. Um, and there it is. Okay. Thank you for checking. Thank you. And uh, uh, would, uh, would anybody like to have uh, any last comment before we conclude the session? See, one of the thing about these activities, uh, both for me and William is that we like to interact with people. We like to connect with more people. So uh, if anybody want to just, you know, uh, say hi, hello, even that is okay. And Sunil, what do you think? Uh... You want to, uh, I, I have a, a third part that I'd love to do um, uh, if you're interested in having me back sometime. Yeah, definitely, William. It, it, it would be a pleasure for me. So... Well, let me know. I'm happy to pick up right where we left off. Uh, and yeah. Okay, so uh, are there any comments? Anybody would like to say something? Okay, so I think most of the things are in chat box and uh, I'll share all the uh, all the messages with you later. So thank you, Will, once again. And uh, uh, thank you all the participants. It's 11.30 and still most of the people are with us right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Will, once again. Thank you, everybody. Such an honor, pleasure to be, to be connected. Uh, and I hope the connection grows. Uh, and uh, it's really nice because the COVID thing sucks.
<laughs> it's nobody, you know, it is nice to find anything positive coming from this. And this is probably one of the most positive things for me coming from it. So thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Will. Bye, everybody.